Does everyone have an outline? All right. This morning I'd like to talk about the subject of spiritual goals, something I've taken some notes on uh, for quite a while, and I thought it'd be good after accomplishing our fair ministry this, this summer, last week in Alexandria, then Howard County a few weeks before. Um, these, these events uh, take planning and take work, and they set an assignment of a goal that we want to accomplish, and uh, having accomplished it, even just a small thing like that, uh, it, it's, it's fun to have the achievement of not only accomplishing a small goal that you set, but also seeing fruit from it. Amen. Conversations, uh, people uh, hearing the gospel, people uh, talking about the gospel with others and, and speaking the truth with others. So it's, it's great to see fruit that comes from just the effort and the work that comes out of the goals that you set. And this is just a general life principle that uh, if you do not uh, set a goal, you'll never reach it <laughs> because you, you've never done it. Uh, Zig Ziglar, if some of you have heard self-motivational speaker Zig Ziglar, he used to say, if you aim for nothing, you'll hit it every time. And so the idea there is you need to set some goals. You need to have an aim. And uh, people set goals all the time uh, in their life. If you don't, you ought to. Maybe that's why your life's not going anywhere. But if you have goals in your finances, for example, whether you're saving a certain amount or you're budgeting a certain thing, you have plans and goals for that, whether you're saving for retirement or whatnot, uh, you want to be financially independent is a common goal people have. They're trying to attain that through different means. Uh, maybe your career, you have different goals. You know, I want to move here or do that, have more flexibility, more time away, uh, working remotely, whatnot. I want to go to college. I want to uh, attain this degree and certification. Whatever it is, you have career goals. And you take steps to attain those things. People work hard most of their lives to attain these things. Health goals may be on some of your, some of your list of goals. Well, you need to lower your cholesterol, you know, better blood pressure, exercise more, eat healthier, you know, that sort of thing. And so we have specific goals. Well, how do you, how do you be healthy? Well, you've got to get down to the granular level, and you've got to not eat that and eat this and this sort of thing. Take these vitamins, these supplements. There's specific things you must do to attain the goal that either you or your doctor prescribed for you. Bucket list, people have those, things you always want to do in your life, and so you're very specific about those. I've always wanted to do this or that. You make a list of those things. You try to achieve some of them, and uh, so people set goals for themselves. This is a common thing to do. But when it comes to Christianity, it comes to your spiritual goals. Because people don't understand generally spirituality or the spiritual life, or life in Christ at all, it definitely you know, prevents them from setting goals in it, especially if they, uh, they don't know what it is, you can't set specific goals. So what does this mean to set spiritual goals? And I'm only using the context of goals to show us what God would have us do in this life before glory, okay? Um, if you think your life is good for nothing now, before glory, then nothing good will come of your life now. And so, if you're saved by God's grace, you trust the gospel of Christ's finished work on the cross, he did everything necessary for you to be saved, you're forgiven of your sins, you have eternal life through his resurrection, you have a hope, a certain hope of glory when you die. Amen. A hope of resurrection, new body, eternity with God, without sin, without death, without pain. It's great, it's glorious. That is the hope of the Christian, is what happens when you die and face the Lord in judgment. No longer is he against you, but now he's your savior, right? So that's the hope of the gospel, and that's the hope of when we die, the Christians have salvation. Um, and yet, sometimes we fall into the type of thinking that, well, if that's our hope and glory, then that's all there is to it. And the rest of my life, I'm just waiting around till that happens. You know? And that's really not the situation. And uh, so Christians have a hard time identifying specific spiritual goals. And if they do identify a spiritual goal for themselves, I need to pray more and read the Bible more. Sometimes it's hard to measure those things. Reading the Bible might be one of the easier goals to set because you can very easily measure that. Uh, how much did I read yesterday, tomorrow, next week? You can measure that pretty easily. But what about you being thankful? How do you measure that? How do you know if you're successful at that? You know, about walking worthy? How do you measure this? So people tend to think spiritual, spiritual things are hard to measure. They're hard to know if you're succeeding at it. What are the metrics? Ephesians 2 verse 3, Paul says <clears throat> that when we were dead in trespasses and sins before we were saved, uh, we had our conversation in times past, this is your life without God, in the lusts of our flesh. You say, wait a minute, I didn't live my life in lusts. Well, the biblical definition of the word it has to do with whatever pleases you, whatever you wanted to do. That's the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. So you walked and had your conversation in your life was according to whatever you wanted, and you're fulfilling the desires of the flesh and your mind. You see the fulfilling of those desires there? Those were goals that you had. Those were things you were trying to achieve. And they were according to what? Whatever you wanted. You get to pick. 
What do you want to be? What do you want to do? How you spend your time? You got to decide all these things. This is according to you. And you try to fulfill those things. And Paul says that by nature, we were children of wrath. Well, wait a minute. I was just trying to do whatever I wanted. And I was actually making progress on some of my life goals. But you're a child of wrath. You're a sinner that needs saved. The gospel interrupts that, of course, and the kindness and love of God toward you entered your life, and you're saved by God's grace, and you trusted him, and now you have more information to base your decisions on. Amen. You're now a new creature. So even though in the flesh you desire to fulfill something in the flesh, in the spirit, now that you're in the spirit, you're saved, what should we desire to attain? What should we desire to fulfill? Before we fulfill the desires of our flesh, what do we desire to fulfill now? What are the spiritual goals that we should have? Okay. As I mentioned, there is a hope that all Christians have in common, and there are many passages you can use to show that hope that we have, the hope of glory. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 being one place where if you're looking to talk about motivating people towards a goal, you, you, you can't not read Philippians 3. In verse 11, Paul says, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. What a hope. Right? We have the promise of resurrection. Paul's pressing toward the mark. Down in verse 13, I count not myself to have apprehended. I'm not yet there, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark. That is literally going toward a goal. Right? Yeah. Press toward the mark. For the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so this is Paul pressing toward the ultimate goal, which he says to attain the resurrection of the dead. You know how you attain the resurrection of the dead? You die. <laughs> That's how you do that. And so you say, well, that's easy. That's uh, literally falling off a log. I can do that. And then I get resurrection glory. And so Paul's talking about pressing toward that mark. Of course, he's doing that with the right mind, and that's what he's dealing with here. But all those in Christ have a hope of glory. Romans 8.18 says, The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in you, Amen. you that are in Christ, you that are saved. So all of us have that hope of glory if you're saved. We don't have to earn it. It's not that we deserve it. It's given to us by grace. It's given to us freely. And of course, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Paul says, The mystery should be made known, that God would make known was the riches of the glory, the glory, the brilliance, the excellence of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. And that's not the end. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. You see, people are trying to attain glory and in Christ, with Christ in you, you have the hope of glory. You have the promise of it. Okay. The Olympics was in the news this last week quite frequently and uh, for different reasons. And uh, many people don't know the history of the Olympics. It originated in the Greek civilization, uh, and it was very religious. It was actually created as a religious uh, activity to appease the gods. Created by, they think, Zeus and Heracles, things like that. You traveled over to, to, to Greece and... You would perform these games in honor to, to their gods. And the winners would get an olive wreath, a laurel, right? And that's all they got, along with fame and fortune from their sponsors. But beyond that, the thinking was that in, in the Greek religion, the false religion, it was very hard to get immortality. So this life is why they worked so hard for things they had in this life. Um, and they would die, and if they, they had a very little hope of immortality. But if you were a champion of the Olympic Games, you had a hope of immortality. And so literally, not only in this life, but also in eternity, they believed and taught that the winners would have immortality. Uh, many people also don't know that the athletes who played in those games all did it naked. Yeah. And so just things people don't know, you know, the more you know. So <clears throat> what am I saying this for? Because Paul's talking about the hope of glory that you have in Christ. Amen. We can't underestimate that, folks. People have strived for immortality in life, and still even to today, even if they don't believe in the afterlife, they try to seek a legacy in their life, and you've been given the hope of eternal glory freely in Jesus Christ. And all those that believe can have it. And thank God for that. You don't have to be an Olympic champion. I mean, I'm looking around the room here, you know, it's just like, not going to happen, you know. But we have eternal life <laughs> in Christ Jesus. Every Christian has a hope of glory. Uh, we have a hope, look at Colossians 1 verse 5. Paul says, we have a hope laid up for us in heaven. He says, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? Where is our hope? Is it in now, in the earth, in your circumstances? Well, no, it's, it's in heaven. It's laid up there for us. Well, how do you get up there? Well, you got to die. You know, you die, and you resurrect to glory, and you get that 
the hope realized. Colossians 3, verse 2, Paul mentions it again. Set your affection on things above, not on the things on the earth. For ye, ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. And so this is the hope, the ultimate mark. Paul says he pressed towards the mark. The mark is his death, that he might know and attain resurrection. Right? And uh, so th this is taught throughout the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, of course, talks about resurrection, the hope we have there. But when you constantly talk about, and I'm not diminishing at all, the hope we have in Christ, it's something we should glory in and live by completely. And we'll see later, it actually affects these other things Paul talks about. But if you only have hope in eternity and don't think about what God's doing now, and I'm no longer talking about going back to your flesh and the lust of your flesh, but if you don't ask the question, what did God would have me do now? It tends to make this life as the Christian undesirable and empty in comparison to glory. Have you been there? It's like, well, I can't wait for heaven. It's going to be glorious. And it's almost like there's now nothing left to do now. Like I'm just waiting around for heaven. This life is less desirable than heaven. Fact, right? Less desirable. And it's empty compared to glory. Paul says it's not worthy to be compared to the glory that should be revealed in you. Amen. Right? And so what's the point of this life? Do you see that quickly gets into vanity? Like, what's the point? If, like, glory is so great, we have it already, and it's there after we die. This life is miserable in comparison. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if we have hope in this life only, we're of all men most miserable. Amen. Which means we have to have the hope of glory or else this life is, is misery. But what about this life? Is there any spiritual goals we should set? Or is our goal heaven? Is that the first goal? Die, go to heaven. Then I can start living in glory. Is that it? Or is there something that the mystery of Christ, the gospel of Christ, informs us about, that the Bible tells us about, that we should try to attain before resurrected glory? So what in the world could you attain before resurrected glory? Well, apparently it turns out there's some things. Because you've been given this treasure in earthen vessels. You have the spirit given to you now. You have the scripture given to you now, which can change the way you think and how you respond, sometimes only in this life, in the presence of opposition, suffering, and sin and pain. Okay? So are we just waiting for heaven? Is that what Christians do? Well, so now you're saving and going to heaven, you're just waiting around. What is the goal before glory? Of course, God's will is stated in the scripture very clearly, that all men be saved, which is giving them the hope of glory in heaven forever, and come to knowledge of the truth, that being the hope of glory in Christ Jesus forever, among other things. 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, Paul tells Timothy to uh, find faithful men, right? And to uh, teach, uh, who are able, uh, able to teach others. Yes. Faithful men are able to teach others and teach them. Okay? I butchered that verse. Look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Okay, well, teach them what? You say, well, the gospel. The gospel gives them eternal life. Yes, that's a thing. What else? What else is there? It's glory, right? There's hope of glory. What's, what's bigger than eternal life? Well, eternal life is the great and glorious truth. But when you talk about ministry, and you're talking about faithful workers and ministers and stewards and those who hold fast word of truth, there's something that needs to be attained now in order to walk worthy of the Lord before glory. Okay. So let's go to Colossians 1. I want to go to Colossians 1 today to see how Paul lays out some things he desires for the saints in Coloss as an example of certain spiritual goals that we should desire to attain in the Spirit, in life, before glory. And by the way, I'm not teaching this lesson here to, to bring condemnation on you or anything. I'm just trying to bring light to the fact that because of what God's revealed to the Scripture, that there are certain goals that we should identify Amen. and be working to, to attain. Right? And then we can know how we attain them. And hopefully give you hope that you can actually attain these things. These aren't so far out there that no one could ever attain them. Paul strived for them. He labored for them. And he saw fruit in people. And maybe you've seen some of this fruit in yourself. And that's a good thing. Because you can put it to use. And in Colossians 1, Paul lays out four spiritual goals for the Colossians that they should attain or try to attain or desire to attain before glory. Okay, before their death and resurrection. So look at Colossians 1, verse 1. Just to get some context here. Paul's writing to the saints and faithful brothers in, Col in Colossus. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Coloss uh, Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is talking to saints and faithful who already, look at verse 3, 
says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith. These people have faith, right? They have faith in Christ Jesus. They have faith in the gospel. And of the love which you have to all the saints. These saints, faithful brethren, have faith in the gospel, and they have love toward the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. By the way, it tells you how they love the saints. They love the saints that they might have hope laid up for them in heaven. Amen. Right? And so what you see here is faith, hope, and love, or similar to 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul says the greatest of these things that remain is faith, hope, and charity. Right? Faith is the truth working in you to believe the gospel to be saved. Hope, uh, uh, faith is you receiving the gospel. Hope is, is it working in you so that you have actually a hope and a, an expectation of some good. And charity is you seeing the truth benefit other people. Amen. That's what charity is. And this is why he says the love for the saints for the hope. So they were having hope of glory. They were looking forward to glory. And they were wanting other people to have that glory as well. And so you preach the gospel to them for them to be saved. And that's an act of love. And that's what he's saying, love toward the saints. And he says, Whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in, in all the world. So these are saints and faithful people who have the truth working in them toward hope. And they're trying to evangelize other people to see souls saved according to that truth. And it's to these people, he sets these spiritual goals. So again, I hope you see the context here. We're speaking here to people who are believers, those who have, have a hope of glory, and those who want to see other people be saved. That's us, right? That's you, maybe? That's, this is where we're at. That's what we should be, anyway. And this is who Paul is talking to. In Colossians 1, verse 6, he says that the gospel, the truth of the gospel they heard, has come into all the world and brings forth fruit. What's the fruit here? Well, people are getting saved. That's what the gospel does. It saves people, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Okay, so the gospel brought fruit among these people who loved, look at verse 7, as ye have learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. They heard it from Epaphras. He's the one that ministered the gospel to them. Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. You see, these people knew the gospel. They heard it, and they wanted other people to hear it, and they were preaching it, and it brought forth fruit to people to be saved. And so they were getting people saved by it. They were evangelizing here. And they had the hope themselves, of course, of glory. And it, it, Paul saw this. He testifies to the, the, the goodness of why other people, how other people are getting saved from their own testimony and their ministry. Okay. But he also recognizes in verse 7 how, or verse 8 rather, how Epaphras declares unto him their love in the Spirit. Right. This sets the tone for the spirituality of these things Paul's talking about. When you get saved, Ephesians 1.13, you receive the Holy Spirit. You're sealed with the Holy Ghost. And so, what are the things of the Spirit? We tend to ask ourselves. Well, you heard the gospel, didn't you? The gospel that saved you, that quickened your spirit, that gave you hope of glory. Those are spiritual things. Amen. Right? Those are things. And how they love in the Spirit. That's why he's defining the love there. It's not just loving generally. It's loving in the spirit that people hear the word of the gospel. They'd be saved and have that hope. And he says, because you love in the spirit. Look what he says in verse 9. For this cause, because you heard the gospel, you have hope in it. Because other people are hearing it because of you. Because of your love in the spirit. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire. And we'll get to what he prays and desires for in a moment. But. He says, for this cause, because you have a love in the Spirit for other people to benefit from the spiritual truth of the gospel and the hope of glory laid up for you in heaven. Why is Paul praying? Because before attaining spiritual growth and goals, you need to know what they are and want to reach them. Amen. Even if you have a goal laid in front of you, if you don't even want to attain it, it's not going to happen either. And thus Paul prays, here you see an example of prayer producing desire, and he says, I pray and desire. What does he pray for? Things that he desires. And they're spiritual things, right? Yeah. And so he's praying and desiring these spiritual things for the Colossians. So that's where we need to be as well. If we're talking about spiritual goals in our life, things that we should desire and attain, we ought to want that, want to attain a spiritual goal. Because like, as we said earlier, if you don't think you need to attain anything, you won't attain anything. You won't go anywhere if you don't think you need to go anywhere. You won't grow anywhere if you don't think you need to grow anywhere. Right? And so Paul starts listing in Colossians 1, 9, 10, and 11, and 12 these spiritual goals. And each one of these spiritual goals concerns your life now. And that's what I'm trying to point out here. 
There is the affections of things in heavenly places where Christ returns in glory, and that's our glorification, what a day that will be. We should always set our affections on that ultimately. But until then, what in the world do we do? What are the metrics? What are the goals? What are we trying to attain here? We're just getting souls saved. That's what the Colossians were doing. Let's just evangelize, get the people the gospel. Good. We did that in the fair last week. Right? It's a good thing to do, and it's a glorious and rejoicing thing to do when you see people hear the gospel. But what else? Is that it? Well, that by itself would be glorious. Right? But Paul lists some things here, and none of them specifically are, go and tell people the gospel. They all concern the Colossians, who are faithful already, who know the gospel, have a hope of glory. Well, what are they to do? Right? So each one concerns their life right now before glory. Each one of these things, there's four of them, concern God. So it's them and God. So it's not, not, not just their self-improvement. Make sure you clean up your act here. It has to do with their relationship to God and their, their perspective towards God. They also, each one of these four things, gives you a metric or a measure of how you know you've attained it, which is helpful, right? The doctor says, you're overweight. All right, doc, how many pounds? <laughs> What's the goal that I'm trying to set here? What do I need to get under to meet the goal? Paul says, here's what I'm praying for you. Here's the thing that you need to attain. How do I know if I attained it? It tells you in these verses, so we'll lay this out. Let's look at verse 9 here. The first thing Paul prays for and desires for them, that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Amen. And all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might be filled with the knowledge. This sounds like Ephesians 5, 17. Be not unwise, but understand the will of the Lord. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Be not unwise. You need to be filled with knowledge and wisdom. Paul says God's will is that all men be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Well, there's the truth of the gospel, then there's more truth than just the gospel, right? That we need to minister and teach to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. So, that you might be filled with knowledge. This is a spiritual goal. Okay. Many Christians really denounce excessive Bible study or learning or teaching. Be careful, folks. That's something Paul prays the Colossians have. Amen. How else do you be filled with knowledge if you're not Bible studying and learning and listening? Right? And so why do we need to be filled? Why is this a goal? Well, if you don't understand spiritual things, then you cannot attain them, that's for sure. Right? If you don't understand the things of the Spirit, how are you going to produce its fruit? If you want the fruit of the Spirit, you want to walk in the Spirit, you want to attain the spiritual things that, that Paul is pointing out here, then you need to understand spiritual things. That's what he says. He prays that they might be filled with the knowledge of, his, of God's will, and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. All right. Now, how do you do this? Well, this is where Bible study comes in. This is where learning comes in. A renewed mind. Paul is talking Colossians later in the epistle. He prays it first, and then Colossians, he lays it out, teaching them things so that their mind gets set right. And Colossians is a great book to study about various doctrines and how to respond to wrong doctrines and how to be complete in Christ and things like that. These are, this is information. This is knowledge. you got to understand the spiritual realities of these things at the get-go. So if you're at a place where like, well, I just don't understand all these things, that's normal. We're all been there. We're all there even to various degrees. But the prayer is that you be filled with knowledge. Right? That's easier for some than others, it seems like, but it's something God would have all of us come to, a knowledge of the truth. Right? So this is where Bible study is put. This is where learning is necessary. This is why the church comes together to open the Bible to teach it. This is why you should read the Bible. This is why we should seek understanding of the Bible. Not just reading it, but knowing what it says. Because it's the knowledge God wants us to have. And it's not just general knowledge. Let's draw a bunch of maps and make sure you memorize all the names in the Scripture. You know, it's knowledge of His will. Right? So the spiritual goal is the knowledge, be filled with the knowledge of His will. Because if you can live life now till glory with the knowledge of His will, you will make right choices better than if you did not know His will. Which is why he says the knowledge of his will in all wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to make right choices. That requires the right information to do so. Right. So that's goal number one. How do you know you've, you've reached this goal? How do you know you're successful at attaining knowledge? Or rather being filled with it. Because that's what he says, being filled with it. All of us can get some knowledge of it, but being filled with it? What's that mean? That means you abound. That means you do not lack Wisdom in the will of God. You don't lack it. I mean, you can claim, you say, well, do you know the will of God? You say, yes, I know it. But do you abound in it? Do you, do you, do you lack any knowledge of it? You completely understand it. Some of you are going, yeah, 
all, all, all that I know I know. Others going, well, not, not entirely. Being filled, that's the goal. Well, how do you do that? You come to the scripture. You learn. You make sure you understand what it says. Colossians 1 verse 10, goal number two. <clears throat> he says, that you might walk worthy of the Lord. Let me say one more thing about the first goal here in verse 9 about how you know you've achieved success in this goal to some degree is when you actually understand something. It says spiritual understanding. It's one thing being taught, going through a course, regurgitating the answers to the questions. That's different than understanding it yourself. And you need to understand according to God's purpose here. So as long as that takes, maybe it'll take the rest of your life. That's what should happen. Verse 10. The second goal is that you might walk worthy. Remember, he prays and desires that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will. And, and, and verse 10, that you might, be, walk, walk, might walk worthy of the Lord. Notice the, these two goals here are separated by that semicolon there in verse 9. That's how you separate these things. But it says that you might walk worthy of the Lord. How do you walk worthy of the Lord? Unto all pleasing. Maybe you should walk in your flesh. No. Walk in the Spirit, right? Walk, the worthy walk of the Lord is being worthy of how you came to be in the Lord. Which was what? By grace or by law? By grace. Was it through your works or faith? Well, it's faith. It's a walking worthy. You'll be walking by grace, walking by faith, walking in the knowledge of his will. That's what that is. Okay? It is an unworthy walk of God's grace for you to try to walk under the law when he saved you by his grace. Amen. Okay? You trying to keep the law is unworthy of someone saved by grace. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> That's a worthy walk. In Romans 6, verse 4, it says, we, we walk in newness of life, being baptized in the likeness of his resurrection. Right? So there's a worthy walk. Romans 6 describes it. No, you're not. You've been baptized into his death. You're dead to sin. And you've been baptized in the resurrection. You walk in newness of life. That's a worthy walk. So when Paul says he wants to attain the resur resurrection of the dead, he, of course, is looking for his final resurrection in glory, but he's trying to bring that into now because he is alive in Christ. Amen. The life he lives in the flesh, he lives by the faith of the Son of God. And so he's trying to live a glorious life now, resurrected as he will in eternity, despite even the hindrances of this mortal flesh in the world around us. So trying to walk worthy of the Lord in what he's done for us. Romans 8 verse 1 says we're to walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. There's no condemnation of walking after the Spirit. Well, that's a worthy walk then. Walking after the Spirit. Why do we need to walk worthy of the Lord and all-pleasing? Well, how you move to the goal is important. Here's the Christian, and here's glory when they raise from the dead. That's, that's great. That's what the cross accomplishes right there, the death and resurrection, right? They have to die to get there. That's their death. How do they live here is what we're trying to figure out. Amen. Like, how do we live from here to here? Well, you press on. Yes, you do. You press on. How do you do it? Like, what's the goal? Well, number one was be filled with the knowledge of his will. And number two is walk worthy. If you don't know God's will, you don't know what God's trying to do here. Obviously, he's trying to save people into heaven. But what's he trying to do here? What's his will? See, all souls saved is one part of it. You should be filled with the knowledge of his will. The in everything give thanks, the avoid fornication, all, everything that he says he wants done here. Because there's things you can only do on this side of glory that he wants done. Well, while you're doing his will, you need to do it worthily. Amen. Right? So as you're doing it, you need to walk a certain way. How you move to the goal is just as important as reaching the goal. You will get that goal of death. You're going to get there. But this is all so important for you. It's part of God's will. I'm not saying it's important for your salvation. Christ died on the cross. I'm saying it's important for your service in the street of the Lord, right? These spiritual goals. If you're going to get to a goal at one point, you're going to walk some sort of way there. That's why you've been called to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you've been uh, called in Christ Jesus. How do you do it? Well, you walk in the Spirit. You walk by faith. You're faithful. Philippians 3 talks about this in verse 16. He says, Nevertheless, he presses towards the mark, right? And he says, nevertheless, 
Whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. While we're approaching resurrection glory that we haven't attained yet, then we should mind the same thing. See what he says? The same rule. The same doctrine. Be of one mind. That takes work, folks. I mean, you can be of one mind in yourself, and that itself might take work if you're double-minded, but try dealing with another person. Try being one with another person. This is called ministry. Amen. Trying to persuade other people of the truth, being like-minded with them. So walking worthy of who you are, you're members of the body of Christ, which means you're not the only member. God doesn't only have one toe. He's got lots. And so you got many people you got to work with. And this is the idea of walking worthy of who he's made you. In Philippians 3, verse 17, he says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as you have us for an ensample. You don't know what Paul did after he died in glory. You have no idea. There's no scripture here. He was glorified with the Lord. He's there now. Right? What you know from Paul and his pattern was this, before he died. So when we talk about following Paul's pattern, we're talking about this, right? Like we hear his gospel to get us this, this glory and salvation. But the pattern that we live by is how he lives, what he says. Amen. Mark them which walk so, as he has for an ensample. For many walk, this is their life before death, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. If you're saved by grace, it's not your works. You can live the rest of your life in the lust of your flesh, pursuing fulfilling the lust of your flesh. Not good. But you can be saved. But Paul says, mark those that walk worthy, so you have those as an ensample. And do so. Many walk, as I told you often, and now tell you weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. And so, what's the worthy walk? Well, minding the right things. How do I know what things they are? Well, you need to know God's will, remember? <laughs> Being filled with the knowledge of his will. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2 says that we're stewards of the mysteries of God. It's required of stewards to be faithful. You know what faithful is, don't you? Faithful is something that happens over time when you hold to something. You believe it here. If you don't hold to it, and here you are trying to walk the road, and you go, yep, yeah, I'm taking a departure here, and going over there, and I'm going over here. You didn't, you didn't hold to the truth. right? And so holding fast, being faithful to the truth is what the worthy walk is about. Being faithful to it. What's success look like? In Colossians 1, verse 10, he says, Walk worthy the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Wait a minute. I thought I was filled with the knowledge of God. But you were in verse 9, and now in verse 10, because of your worthy walk, you increase in the knowledge of God. You ever been there? If you have grown at all as a Christian, you've been here. Because you learn some truth, and then you start applying it to your life, and then you learn something else because you did that. This is increasing the knowledge of God. That word increase means to grow. This is Christian growth right here. How do you do Christian growth? It's not just study. It requires knowing, but then it requires walking in it. Amen. Else, you're not using anything that you know. Right? So how do you know you're being successful in this goal? Is that you, you are being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You're growing in the knowledge of God. It's good to know if that's being met. Looking back and saying, have I, grow, grew, have I grown in the knowledge of God? It's like, yes, I have. And I learned a lot by doing the things God wants me to do. And now I know even more about God and his faithfulness and the truth of his word. Right? Well, you're meeting this goal. You see what's going on there? It's like when you skip a meal, you exercise for half an hour, you get on the scale and you go, oh, I lost a half a pound. Good. You're not there yet, but you're attaining it. How do you know? Because you're going the right direction. <laughs> How do you know you're keeping this one? You're increasing and growing in the knowledge of the Lord. Right? You're walking worthy of it and to all pleasing. How do you know I'm pleasing God at what I'm doing? Well, you've got to know his will. Let's go to verse 11. The third thing he mentions here. He prays and desires that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and to all pleasing. So you get saved, know the truth, and you understand his will, that you would walk in it, be faithful in it. Verse 11, strengthened with all might. This is what he wants for the Colossians that they might be strengthened with all might. This is interesting. He wants them to have power. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. Because you can have the power of God unto salvation. That's the gospel of Christ. You can have the hope and power of God to conquer death, which is what saves you when you believe it, and live powerless here. 
And what I mean by that is simply not operating according to the strength and power of God he's provided you, trying to get through life on your own strength and your own power, like everyone else does. But you knowing the truth of God, you knowing you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you knowing what he's provided for you in his word, gives you a strength that no one else has if they're not saved. And that's what Paul prays the Colossians, that they have hope of glory, and they're preaching the gospel, getting people saved, but he prays that they might be strengthened with all might. Ephesians 3, verse 16 says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. You see this? By the way, each one of these things, I mentioned they all concern God, but quite literally they all concern the spirit of God working in you. So it's a testimony of that. If you're growing in the knowledge of his will, be filled in all, that's the Holy Spirit. Where do you get his will? The word of God. If you're walking worthy, you're walking after the Spirit. And here, the third thing is strength with all might. Well, where does that strength come from? The Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And he says in Ephesians 3, verse 16, that you be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. You see that? Ephesians 6, verse 10, he says to put on the armor of God. And he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on this armor because you're fighting a fight, you know. And the power of the, what is the power of the Lord? It comes from the gospel initially. It comes from his word working effectually in you. Said so another way, it comes from Christ in you. Because that's what you learn from the word. That you're in Christ and Christ is in you. Right? And that's strength because you alone can't solve the problem. You alone don't have the strength. Your strength will get less and less by the time you die. Right? Well, and then you say, that's the great hope, that I'll be so weak at the moment of death. And I'll, yes, that's true. That is the glorious hope, right? But how about here? How do you live here? Well, I'll just, I'll just live weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. Well, you need to have strength, even if it's not your own. You need to have strength in Christ. Amen. So that even though you're physically getting weaker, you need to be strong in the Lord. That's the goal. Right? You cannot change the decline of your mortal flesh. But, according to this... You can strengthen your inner man. And that can happen the rest of your life. And that's what Paul prays for them. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, Paul mentions this. He talks about the glorious gospel of the grace of God. And he says in, in verse 6 that God commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We know God's glory because Christ died and rose from the dead, and we believe it. And so we can have the knowledge of his glory in Christ Jesus. But, verse 7, we have this treasure, the treasure of knowing the glory of God that we are promised through Jesus Christ, in earthen vessels. Do you have your earthen vessels here in your resurrection? The answer is no. They get changed into a celestial, glorified vessel. Immortal, incorruptible. Earthen vessels are what you have here before your death in life now. And he says, we have the treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. You know, you will get more power in yourself here because you get glorified. Here, you have no power in yourself. But he says, he wants, you have it now so that you might know the excellency of the power of God in you. Maybe of God and not of you. That's what he goes on to say, we're troubled on every side. There's the weakness that you have in your flesh, yet not distressed. Why? Because of the power of God through Christ Jesus. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. If you go down to verse 16 and 17, he says, Which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, there's your earthen vessel, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. By what, exactly? Reaching for the spiritual goal that Paul's talking about. Christ in you, knowing his will, walking worthy of the Lord, being strengthened by his might, not yours. That's the renewal. That's the renewal that has an endless supply because it's in the infinite God who provided it through Christ Jesus freely to you. doesn't matter how many vitamins you take, they won't work one day. <laughs> you know, that's the idea. But the renewal every day here does work, can work. That renewal is based on God's will, the walking after the Spirit, knowing that your strength rests in Him. He says in verse 17, For our light affliction, which is what he calls life in the vessels, is but for a moment. It works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 
So that's balancing the glory here to what we have here. But that's part of the strength that we have in God's might. Okay. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, we have an example of this. It's frequently touched on subject here regarding prayer and miracles and everything else. But Paul needs strength in his earthen vessel, he claims, to do service to the Lord better. Be more effective as a minister. And the Lord Jesus denies him his, his request. Because in verse 9, Jesus says, My grace is sufficient for thee. I've given you the strength of my grace. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength, grace, is made perfect in weakness. That is your weakness. Most gladly, Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you see? Paul says, Your spiritual goal is that you be strengthened with the power of his might, not yours. Okay, so what's Colossians 1 saying? Colossians 1, verse 11. Strength with all might, according to his glorious power. Not your glorious power. That's something you got to learn, folks. Because especially when you're able to do things. You know, we did things this last week at the fair. We did it by our own hands. We, we tore things up. We, we built things. We put things on the, the tracks. We handed them out. A lot of things we did. Right? But you know what? All that's vain. Unless God's word is being communicated to people. Amen. Right? Make sure the tracks say clearly what the Word of God says. Make sure that people understand the thing. It's all vain, right? There's a lot of other ministries that are trying to do things like that, hand things out and expose people to truth, and yet they're not speaking truth. So see, it's all vain. Our work is meaningless without what Christ did. In fact, it's being strengthened by His might. So what strength do we have in the ministry that we do? It's not because we're great skilled orators or charismatic personalities. It's what God is doing in us through His Word. Okay, So Paul says that he glories in infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That changes how you look at things in your weakness. If you know the strength comes from Christ. This is where Philippians 4 belongs. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Because he says I can abound, I can be abased. I can suffer need, I can have you know, a feast. I can do all things through Christ. It doesn't matter the things that I do because it's not I in my strength that I'm trusting. I want to know, he says, the strength of God in Christ. And so I can know generosity in Christ if I abound. I can know the suffering of Christ if I don't. Either way, he says, I can know the strength and power of Christ. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen with me. Look at Colossians 1.11. How do you know if you're successfully meeting the spiritual goal? What's the metric of success here? Here's how you know. Look at the verse. It says, strength with all might according to his glorious power unto what? Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. If that's what you see, you're meeting the goal. Amen. You see patience, you see long suffering, success. Because <laughs> that strength that God provides is important to produce that. Yes. Right? That's not how man would do it. Man would say, if God's really strong, he'd remove this thing from me. Right? What's the verse say? Unto all patience and long suffering. That's stronger than removing it. Amen. which doesn't make God's strength any more powerful at all. And so, notice the with, with the joyfulness there, which is interesting. Does it mean going through sufferings is a good time? This is glad to be waiting, is what this is. Patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. This is, I'm glad to do it. This is the definition of your welcome. Right? I'm glad to do this. Well, why are you glad to do it? It, it was an inconvenience on you. It could have been a suffering for you. It could have brought you some pain. You've had that response on smaller scales where you tell people you're welcome when they say thank you because you've done something for them that cost you something. Right? You say, you're welcome. I'm glad to do it. You ever had that happen on a bigger scale? You sacrifice a lot more of your time and money, your health, or whatever it is, for someone else. And they say, thank you. That feeling of, you're welcome. I'm glad to have served and sacrificed and suffered for your sake. That's what he's talking about. For the sake of the Lord, for the sake of other people. He wants them to know that strength. The strength that what your life is now is lived for the sake of others and in Christ. Right? So that when you suffer and you're patient, you're here for the sake of Christ's will performed in other people. And when they say thank you, you say you're welcome. When God says good job, you say you're welcome. That's all I can do. You did everything for me. My life is yours. Amen. Right? What's the opposite of patience, long suffering, joyfulness? Bitterness, complaining. Murmuring, you know, yeah, you owe me, <laughs> that type of thing, right? 
grudges. That's the opposite of that. And you've all been there too. We've all been there. So you're meeting this goal if you exhibit the patience and long suffering, the joyfulness. That's how you know you're meeting it. Colossians 124, look what Paul says. Paul says, I, Paul, a man of minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. How do you get there? I rejoice in my sufferings and fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Tribulation works patience, experience, and hope. Well, hope's a good thing. You can have hope without facing any tribulation. But when you face tribulation, if you get hope at the end, that's because you're applying the strength of Christ. Amen. That's how you get there. And so, strengthen with all might, not your own. That's a goal. Because there's a lot of things that come against you that you can't handle with your own strength. You start whining about it. Well, if I have the strength of Christ, knowing His will, knowing that I have a hope of glory, knowing that my life now is supposed to be a testimony of faithfulness to what God's provided me, then you can rest in His strength. Right? The Bible says, when our heart fails and our flesh fails, who's our portion who's the Savior the Lord is? That's the strength from the Lord. Right? Colossians 1 verse 12. The fourth spiritual goal here. Paul prays and desires that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will, that might be walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, strengthened with all might, giving thanks unto the Father. <clears throat> this is the fourth spiritual goal. This is, of course, God's will from the very start. In Romans 1.21, when he created man, uh, they had no excuse not to know who he was because he was the creator. And yet they were not thankful. They did not glorify him as God. They weren't thankful. Not being grateful to God was the original problem. Not being content with what God graciously gave man was the problem. And so when you, who are saved by God's grace, here in this present evil world, with your mortal flesh, can give thanks to the Father, you're accomplishing His will from the start. Was that in everything, give thanks. So why do we need to accomplish this goal? He's given you so much, that's why. And you'll think you'll need more. In life, you'll think you'll need more. We need to be strengthened with his might because life has suffering and affliction. We need to give thanks to the Father because he has given you more even than what you need. You just don't think so. You see the problem? You think you need more. And Christ says, my grace is sufficient. There's a disagreement on what you need. And when you're thankful to the Father, giving thanks to him, then you're satisfied with what he's given you and you're operating in it. You see? Well, how do you, get, how do, you do this? How do you accomplish this goal? You rejoice in who he is and what he has done. Because you definitely can't rejoice in the evils of the world. You can't rejoice in your own accomplishments in your flesh all the time. But you can rejoice in who he is and what he's done. And what he does in you. Right? So you being a member of the body of Christ, when, when he, Paul says he sees the gospel uh, bearing forth fruit, bringing forth fruit in the world as it does in you, like rejoicing in those things. When you rejoice in the truth and rejoice in the right things, you know what that's doing? You being grateful for what God is doing in the world. Right? Because that's what he's doing. He's seeing souls saved and saints edified. His strength is working in people. And so to be filled with gratitude to God. This is a spiritual goal. It starts out with just knowing what he did and saying thank you for it. But it ends up being a motivating factor for doing all service to the Lord. Because we owe him everything. That's gratitude. <clears throat> giving thanks unto him. <clears throat> Excuse me. What's success in this? <clears throat> Excuse me. What is success when you're uh, reaching this spiritual goal? How do you know you've done this? Well, you'll be thankful in everything. Yeah. Now, like I said, it's easy just to give thanks and thank you, God, for this, thank you, God, for that. But in everything, giving thanks. In every situation, that's how you know you're successful in that. <clears throat> and so, 1 Thessalonians 5 18. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says that. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And uh, that's what Paul is trying to get the Colossians to understand, that in everything they need to give thanks. Uh, the Colossians ultimately were, were doubting their sufficient position in Christ. They were not complete. They, didn't under, they weren't living by what was real. And so Paul is trying to exhort them, look how much Christ has done for you. This is why this giving thanks unto the Father, this last spiritual goal here, how do you know if you've, Attain this, how, how, why and how can we give thanks? He starts listing from verse 12 all the way to down, uh, down to verse 17, the rest of the sentence. Things that God has done for you in Christ. That's what he's doing. How do we give thanks, Paul? For what do we give thanks? Well, 
Uh, he made me to be, to be partakers of his inheritance of the saints and light. He has delivered us, in verse 13, from the power of darkness. In verse 14, he we have redemption through his blood. Verse 15, he's the image of the invisible God, firstborn of every creature. By him all things were created. You're in him, right? Verse 18, he's the head of the body which you're in. He goes on and on, just listing things that God has done for you in Christ. Amen. That should produce in you gratitude. You know, when it doesn't, you're desiring a wrong thing, right? So it's trying to re reorient our, our perspective on what success looks like. <clears throat> so we have these four spiritual goals here. Being filled with, with the knowledge of his will. Walking worthy of the Lord to all pleasing. Which results in your growing and increasing the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Which results in your having the power and mind of Christ. And, and you being patient and long-suffering. And then giving thanks unto the Father which results in you being thankful and everything and doing everything by thanksgiving. So you start giving to other people. Like the real power of thanksgiving in you folks is that you start giving to other people freely because you feel so indebted to what God's done for you. Amen. This is the grace motivation. Why do we serve other people when we don't have to for salvation? Because God has given us so much that we don't deserve. Yeah. And so we give it to others because I have a debt to pay, but I can't pay it anyways. I'm going to do it out of gratitude. That's the idea of thanksgiving. That's a grace purpose in your heart. Notice these same four goals in other places. Look at Philippians 1, verse 8. With these things in mind. Paul's a similar prayer to, to the Philippians. Philippians 1, verse 8. God is my record. How greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. You see his desire coming out here. And this I pray, prayer and desire, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. See the knowledge there? You're going to know his will. You're going to have spiritual understanding. And then it says in verse 10, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. This is the worthy walk of being strengthened with the power of his might. That's what that is. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, under the glory and praise of God. There's your thanksgiving. Right? So Paul has a similar prayer to Philippians. This is the same spiritual goals in this life. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 8. Ephesians 2.8 is a great summary of these four spiritual goals. We often quote it regarding salvation. By grace are you saved through faith. By grace. Isn't that the knowledge of God's will? What's he doing today? Dispensing his grace. Right. And you're saved. You're saved through faith. How do you walk? Faith. What's it say? It's not of yourselves. Oh, the strength of God, you mean. That's right. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Thank you. God, right? That verse isn't just about salvation, folks. It's what we live by, Amen. right? It's our spiritual goals, as he ex uh, explains in Colossians 1, 9 through 12. Look at Colossians 1, 28, so we'll finish up here. Paul doesn't just state these things that he desires for the Colossians. He lives by them. He says, this is what I pray and desire for you. And he explains some of that. And then down at the end of the chapter, he says, we preach Christ and warn every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man, all of these other people, everyone else, perfect in Christ Jesus, complete in him, having attained these spiritual goals. We want everyone to be filled with the knowledge of his will, to walk worthy of the Lord, to be strengthened with his might, to give thanks unto the Father. We want everyone to be perfect that way in the Lord. And he says, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Paul says, that's what I'm trying to attain. I want other people to attain these things too. And so he labors. His labor here before glory is for this. So what's your spiritual goals? You say, well, I'm trying to be financially independent. Well, spiritually, you should depend on God. I'm trying to be more healthy in my flesh. Maybe you should be more strong in the spirit. Amen. Right? You need to have spiritual goals as well and know how to attain them and know what it looks like when you meet them because you can meet them. This does not mean, none of these goals, by the way, if you notice, was live without sin the rest of your life. Not one was. That's impossible. Amen. These, however, can work. Yeah. Strength with his might, walking worthy of being saved by grace through faith, filled with the knowledge of his will, thankful to God, to the Father. You can do that. Right. So, I don't bring these up as some other thing that you have to try to do. It's simply the spiritual growth that God would have work in you. Amen. Right. So we need to have spiritual goals. God's word and the spirit can help you reach them. And this is also why we meet together as an assembly in a church, to help each other attain these things, which are very attainable.
for glory. Uh, while we wait for the hope of glory, which removes all the sin and hindrances from us, we walk eternity forever with him. Right. All right. We'll, we'll stop there. Any questions or comments about questions one? Yes, sir.